All right, part eight of Who the Fuck Did I Marry? So we submitted an offer on the house in Smyrna. I sent it over to Scott, our realtor, and next day comes, Scott asks if we can take a phone call. So he calls us and tells us that the offer was not accepted and the builder did not do a counter offer. We don't exactly know um, why, um, we don't exactly know why he didn't accept it, but the bottom line is that we figured out later on that he didn't want to finish the basement. So the offer was not accepted. The house fell through. I was okay with that because, again, I knew he had put in an offer. So we continued looking at other houses. We found another house um, in Smyrna that he really liked. Um, I thought that it was way too big for just the two of us. Um, and so the price of this home was much higher than the 750000 that Chase had approved for the mortgage. So what he explained to me was that he was willing to do the $750,000 mortgage and he was also willing to put a significant amount of the money in savings on the house, which meant that he was now comfortable going from $750,000 up to about $900,000. Again, his, his whole explanation was, I have the money where I can put down a substantial down payment, bring down the price of the home, and then basically mortgage the rest of it. So that was now the plan. I was not comfortable with a home <laughs> over $900,000. Um, but again, keep in mind, I saw the Chase paperwork. So I was like, I just feel more comfortable sticking at the $750,000 mark. That's what you were approved for. Let's go with that. <sighs> By this point, this is now fall of 2020. Um, we had been talking about marriage. I had my ring. Um, he had made VP at the company. And again, he was calling me every day from work. Um, the, I need to kind of explain how the company was ran because when you think VP, you would think he would be in an office. It was a condiment company, so they actually were producing the condiments, and I'm not saying the name of the company on purpose, but they were producing the condiments um, in this particular plant location. So a lot of times, he would simply tell me that he walked the floor um, checking in with his subordinates basically now how did he go to work for the most part at this point he left before i woke up however pretty much he wore dress pants um kind of like a deep, a dark navy blue cargo pant and he had a polo shirt with a company logo on it what i saw a lot of times is that he would not wear the polo shirt to work he would wear like a company t-shirt he would wear rubber sole shoes and the um, navy blue cargo pants. I didn't think it was a uniform, but it definitely, it reminded me of what someone would wear when I worked at Amazon, if you're going to be doing manual labor. He didn't go to work sloppy looking at all, but it definitely was not suit and tie. Nowhere near suit and tie. Um, it is fair to note that outside of work, he was a man who he loved to dress. He loved to wear the latest Jordans. He loved to collect watches. He collected a lot of Invicta watches. Um, he, he loved to collect hats. He wore hats, baseball caps everywhere because he didn't like the shape of his head. Um, so in terms of how he dressed casually, the man, he could dress. Um, in terms of how he dressed for work, yeah, he didn't dress like a VP. But his excuse was, I'm constantly walking the production floor and I can't be in a suit and tie walking the production floor where they're creating the condiments that we're selling so by this point again this is fall we're still looking at houses um, we're still touring houses as much as we can because it is COVID um, we had found another house that we really liked and a house that I really truly wanted to put an offer in on this was now going to be the second house that we put an offer on he put in the the asking price, I believe, was about seven hundred thousand. He put in under asking um, an offer for about six hundred and fifty thousand. I'm guessing, but I'll try to find the house and put it on this and put it on the story. Um, the reason that that house fell through, we found out that the home was sitting on a septic tank. 
we found out that the septic tank had an issue and it would have taken about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to fix the septic tank the sellers were not willing to fix the septic tank personally i didn't really care for the house that much i'm the one who was like i don't really want it so even though we put an offer in we had 24 hours where we could uh pull our offer back and so we did once we found out i believe it was in the disclosure and if you're a realtor please feel free to tell me if I'm using the wrong terminology, but I believe it was in the disclosure that they told us the septic tank needs to be replaced. That's when I was like, nah, I don't, I don't want that house. Um, so we pulled out, the house fell through. And so I was fine with it because again, I was heavily involved. I saw him sign the offer. I knew every step of what was going on. Our real estate agent, Scott was amazing. But you will see in, when I get to it where he made a mistake as a real estate agent. So house number two fell through. Um, we then moved on, saw a few more houses, and then we get to house number three. I'm going to pause talking about the houses because now I need to introduce what happened with the cars. Stay tuned. Okay, so I just want to clear up some things that I realized um, is kind of creating some confusion. So just allow this video to serve as a stop sign. Let's clarify. First of all, the story, background. He was born in Philly, raised in Philly, and moved to Augusta. Um, story is that he moved to Augusta for high school. After high school, he went to college at San Diego State enjoyed San Diego State, stayed in San Diego for quite a while. Um, got married in out in California, had a house in California, played arena football out in California, but his family was back here in Augusta, Georgia. Um, he still had a lot of family up in Philly, but for the most part, he had a sister in Augusta, he had a sister in Douglasville, he had a brother in Baltimore, he had another brother in Philly, and he had um, a brother in Nashville. So I just want to clarify that in terms of um, the demographic, not the demographics, but the geography. Born in Philly, came to Augusta for high school, went to San Diego State for college, played football, stayed in San Diego, excuse me, stayed at San Diego, got married out there, but still had quite a bit of family here in Augusta, excuse me, here in Georgia. Um, he also had a sister, I think I said, who lived in Douglasville. I have physically met his aunt who lived in Augusta. I've met his brother who lives in Augusta. Um, I have spoken on FaceTime with a brother who lives in Baltimore. Um, and then I will demonstrate how he used to talk to the brother that lives in Philly. That's coming up, you haven't missed that. In terms of the proposal, you did not miss the story of the proposal, I simply didn't wanna share it because it was embarrassing. Basically, he gave me three ring options. We went to a jeweler at the Mall of Georgia. He had me pick out three rings. I told him which one I liked the most because I knew it wasn't a, a romantic proposal at all. I knew which ring I liked the most. I told him which one. He, he basically said, when I'm ready, I'll give you the ring and I'll propose. Fast forward um, about, I guess it was summer because I was actually pregnant when the ring came we were sitting at the dinner table he took the ring box out of his pocket slammed it on the dinner table and I was like what is this he was like open it I opened it inside was the ring that I had wanted um that I had chosen at the jeweler and he was like all right so this means that you're gonna be my wife I was pregnant so Again, when I asked y'all to give me grace, it's because there are certain things that's just like, girl, what was you thinking? Trust me. There's no excuse. Um, so there was never a, will you marry me? It was more of a, we're living together. We're having a baby together. 
um, we need to get married because the backstory also was that his dad was a retired police officer, but at one point his father was a pastor. So he could quote the Bible like nobody's business, as we all know, so can Lucifer. But anyway, he could quote the Bible like no one's business. Um, and so... That's how we ended up engaged. And I was wearing a ring. I was wearing, I will find a picture and I will try to post it. But I was wearing the ring. Um, don't worry, there's more to that story as well. So just want to clarify some things um, for the people who were like, wasn't it weird that he had a sister who um, lived close, but he's from Philly. So I just wanted to definitely bring clarity to what he told me. Um, was the backstory. Born in Philly, came to Augusta for high school, went to California for foot, um, college, played football at San Diego State, played football in arena football, um, worked at Apple, and then joined the condiment company in California, who then transferred him back to Georgia. He was married in California, um, and he told me he got divorced in California. That is important as well. That will come up again later. Um, and so the ex-wife, at this point in time, at the time that I'm telling you part seven, which is the last video I just posted, the ex-wife lived in California with her two kids, his two uh, stepkids. The two stepkids were 17 and 20 or 21 but they were that age group that age group and he was saying that he was very close with them so he wanted to keep a tight relationship with them um and he talked to them if not every day every other day when i say and i, I when i say this i need y'all to understand when i say that he talked to someone it means that he he was on the phone in front of me talking to the person. I hope that that, because I will touch back on this. He was on the phone in front of me talking to the person. So he talked to his siblings every day. He talked to his aunt almost every day. He talked to his family the way I talked to my family almost every day. Um... And again, I will demonstrate how he used to do the phone calls. I will also demonstrate how he used to do the work phone calls because he called me every single day from work. And he would talk to people while he was on the phone with me. And I could hear people in the background. But that's a whole nother part, so... Again, buckle your seats. I promise I'm reading your comments. I'm reading your questions, but I wanted to bring this video just to clarify some stuff. Hopefully this helps. And um, honestly, I hope, I know people are fascinated by this, but more than anything, I hope that there's a woman watching this and she's saying to herself, okay, it's time for me to ask some questions. That's my hope. Part nine of who the fuck did I marry? So we're pausing on the house stuff. Let me tell you about the car. So when I met my ex-husband, I was driving a 2012 Nissan Rogue, um, fully loaded. It had quite a few miles on it, but it, it got me from A to B. It was, in a, it was in good condition, but I was upside down in the car. He was driving a 2018 Ford Taurus um super uh sport mode i know he had a sport mode on the car and i love driving that car um when he told me how he was a regional manager he told me that one of the perks that came with the job was that he would be getting a company car and so we spent time going to range rover of south atlanta um we spent time going to jaguar we spent time going to BMW. We spent time going to uh, Ford, which was on Mount Zion in Morrow, if you all are familiar with that area. He test drove a whole lot of cars. In the end, he decided on a BMW sedan. I was there when he 
test drove the car. I got in the car with him. I loved it. Um, and he explained to the salesperson, you know, I'm getting a company car. I need to get a printout of the full price of the car, tax tag and title. Because what my company is going to do is wire over the money for the car. The salesperson was like, okay, you know, apparently, apparently that happens a lot. So he gave him a printout with the tax tag and title for the car. Um, in front of me and the salesperson, he called the person in the finance department for his job. Obviously, I have no idea what this person's name is, but he called the person, he explained to them, this is the amount of money. He said the president of the company, so-and-so has authorized for him to get a car, not spending more than, I think, 90,000 tax tag and title. The BMW came out to just under 90,000. Um, and so he, I remember this conversation so fucking vividly. So he's he's on the phone in front i'm standing i'm sitting down the salesperson sitting down at their desk and he's like they you know they put me on hold and so he's like he i guess the person comes back and he says um yeah the, the price of the car is blah 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 he was like give me a second and i can send you a picture of that printout that shows tax tag and title for the bmw he gets off the phone he takes a picture of it. He sends it to whoever. He waits about 10 minutes. He calls the person back. He says, did you get it? Apparently the person did get it. But the person who can, who can actually physically do the wire transfer had gone home for the day. So what he says to um, the BMW salesperson, he's like, okay, we're gonna have to do this tomorrow because so-and-so went home for the day. I don't know who the salesperson is. I can only tell you from my viewpoint what I thought. I had no reason to think this was a lie. I really didn't. Because again, you got to keep, please keep in mind the circumstances that all of this is happening. We're inside the dealership. We're sitting at the desk of this person. He gave us the printout. He's on the phone, do, you know, doing business, basically saying, look, I need this is how much money the car is going to cost. He's taking a picture of it. He seemingly is texting someone saying this is how much, you know, this is proof of how much it is. Then he asked the BMW salesperson, I need your wire transfer information. The guy got up, rushed over to, I guess, their finance area to get the wire, the bank wire information. Because obviously you have to wire it a certain kind of way. Rushes back over gives it to my ex-husband my ex-husband's like okay first thing in the morning we will get this wired over and then you know I'll come and pick up the car my fiance me will drive me up here to pick up the car so we leave he felt like because at the time that this all happened I was pregnant so he felt like look we're about to have a baby I don't want you driving that Nissan Rogue I want to get you something up. I want to get you something more secure, something new. I really wanted a Kia. <laughs> I really wanted a Kia tell you ride. Um, and he was like, well, let's let's look at the warranty. This man knew a lot about cars. He knew a lot about the warranty. He knew a lot about the depreciation value. And so he did talk to me a lot about what will we get the most for our money. Um, we test drove, when I say we, I. I test drove a Kia Telluride, a Kia Sorento. He didn't like either of those. He had me test drive a Ford Explorer. He didn't really care for that. Then came time where he really wanted me to get a BMW. Um, he really wanted me to get a BMW X5. So he took me to B Global BMW Imports which if you know anything about Atlanta, it's off of Cobb Parkway, but you can see it off of uh, off the highway. I believe 285 is where you can see the Global Imports BMW dealership. He took me there. He had me test drive an X5 and X6. Um, he also had me test drive a, uh, I think I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, a 525, which was a sedan. I did not like that. I wanted an SUV. 
Um, I loved driving the BMW. He also had me drive an M series, test drive an M series. So he was very adamant that I should get a BMW. The reason being is because according to him, he had a BMW in California when he lived in San Diego. He had a BMW that he loved. It was a white BMW. He showed me pictures of the BMW. So he showed me pictures of this white BMW that he had. And unfortunately, the car got totaled about two months before he moved to Georgia. So he had received um, money, not a lot, but uh, some money to get another car. And he used it to get the Ford Taurus because he was like, I just need a car that's going to get me from A to B until I get into a house and I'm much more settled. For him, he was like, I'm really giving myself 60 days to get settled here in Georgia after moving from California. But then he met me. Again, that's the story. So he had me test drive the BMW. So much so, I loved the BMW. Loved it. I wanted a dark blue BMW with cognac interior. I wanted an X5 and I wanted an M series. So I can clearly tell y'all that's exactly the car I wanted. We were online looking for that particular car because not every dealership had it. I was okay with a black BMW if needed. Um, but I really wanted dark blue and I really wanted that cognac colored interior. So he felt like I want you to still, I want you to consider all of a sudden an Audi Q8. Let's just see how you like it. If you don't really like it, then we will go back to the BMW. I cannot tell you why he switched up. I can't. Um, but I can tell you he took me to an Audi dealership on Peachtree Industrial. He test drove an Audi and I test drove an Audi Q8. Um, I loved the Q8. Loved it, loved it, loved it. But I was tired of test driving cars. By this point, I had test drove test driven so many cars um our weekends were spent either looking at a house or test driving cars and i was picky i will admit that so he had me test drive the q8 i really liked it i finally just told him look i'm good with either the bmw or the audi because i'm tired of, i'm tired of test driving cars he told my family he was buying me a new car because it, keep in mind he had well, not keep in mind. Let me let y'all know. He had met my family initially on Zoom because, again, we were locked down. He had met my family. Um, he also had met my family in person because at this point, it was like, look, if you're not showing any symptoms, maybe we can do family dinner. Um, and so we had. So he had met my family in person. And now we will go ahead and move towards part 10 of this series. Okay, part 10. Who the fuck did I marry? Okay, had to sneeze. All right, so at this point, I had test driven all these cars. Kia's, um, hell, he even had me test drive a Nissan Murano, but the main two were BMW and an Audi. He had told my grandfather he was getting me a car. He had told my aunt he was getting me a car. That he was going to, he, he was like, she's going to be my wife. I want her to be in something secure. So my family was really like, wow, you know, uh, wow. You know, who knew that he had this kind of money? Um, and so I hated the fact that he did that. Because anytime he got around my family, here's another red flag to put in, in the United Nations of red flags. He would always talk about money. And he would always brag. I never realized it in real time. I didn't realize it until I was out of the situation. He always bragged about the fact that he could fight, the fact that he had money, and the fact that he played football. Those are the three things he always bragged about. Back to the cars. So I told him, I was like, pick one between the BMW and the Audi, because you said you're buying it. So pick one. So this man chose the Audi. So he takes me to the dealership. I wanted a white Q8. He does the, 
give me the printout of how much it's gonna cost tax tag and title to get this Q8. Gentleman who's helping us gives him the, the printout. He's saying he's going to pay this money for the car out of the savings account that's, that's offshore. That's the story, that's what he's saying. So he apparently is asking the guy, you know, is there a holding fee? Can I pay a holding fee to secure this car while I'm working to get the money transferred? Because obviously with COVID, it's going to take long for the banks to transfer the money. Side note, I need everyone to understand one of the reasons why he was able to get away with the stuff he got away with is because we were on lockdown it's crazy because it's now 2024 but i don't know do we all remember how it seemed like a lot of stuff stopped in 2020 now keep in mind that's not an excuse i'm making because shit still got done but in terms of business as usual business as usual just was not happening in 2020 at this time so when he's saying oh it's going to take a while for the bank to transfer the money the gentleman who was working at audi did not even he didn't make a face he didn't he he didn't blink he was like i know it's going to take a while because of covid so basically what ends up happening is we leave he has the printout he calls the bank or he calls his his um financial advisor does have a name the financial advisor's name is eric i feel comfortable using certain people's names especially if we find out they didn't exist um so he calls eric he tells eric in front of me in front of me hey i need to transfer seventy two thousand five hundred and twenty six dollars whatever the amount was because i'm buying a car for my fiance this is the bank account information. Do you need me to give it to you over the phone or do you need me to email it to you? Pause. I can't hear what the person's saying, but that's what he would do. Do you need me to give it to you over the phone or can I email it to you? Okay. Okay. All right. Give me a few minutes and I'll go ahead and email it to you. All right. Let me know. I'll call you back to let you to find out if you received it. Okay. Hang up. So I'm hearing this because, again, I'm not paying attention to, did I hear anybody on the other phone? Did I hear anybody on the other end? So he um, he proceeds to type up an email, type up something, telling him this is the information that we need. Um, I didn't think anything of it. He called me at work the next day to tell me that the money was sent to Audi, that he called Audi. And he confirmed with Audi that they received the money. What he told me is that the car is going to be um, delivered to the house. Y'all, we it's not that I lived in a hood, because I didn't. But I did not live in an area of Clayton County where you would have a brand new Audi delivered to your house. So I remember saying to him, I don't want that car, like deliver to the house not yet because i need to put that car in the garage and my nissan was i only had a one car garage so my nissan was in the garage so he said okay well let me call them back and change the delivery date can you be home or can you t do a half day so he's asking me can you work a half day so that they can deliver the car and you and you will be home for it i said yes that's fine because again, it's COVID, I'm working from home anyway. Um, I only had to go in the office two days a week. So I, I'm at home the next day. He told me the car would be delivered between the hours of one and three. <sighs> Obviously between one and three, nothing happened. So three o'clock I called him. He's at work, he sends me the voicemail. He calls me back. I said, it's three o'clock. I didn't no one ever came with the car um what's going on and then I remember I was like well do I need to call Audi myself because I thought that you handled it but if you didn't handle it let me do I need to call them and so whenever I would suggest I will handle it he would get very very defensive red flag number 472 
So he was like, no, I will call Audi. Don't do anything. I'll call Audi and find out what's going on. Okay. So I'm at home chilling, cooking dinner, normal night. He calls me back and says, yeah, the car was stuck on the truck in Spartanburg because apparently that's where their deliveries come from. So when he told me this, I was in the kitchen laughing because by this point, I will be honest and I told y'all I'll be honest even when it makes me look bad. I was guilty of, on one hand, I believed him and on the other hand, I was like, let me see what lie he come up with. Let me just see. Um, but keep in mind, my brain was really like not rationalizing, not comprehending how deep the lie was. I just thought that no one told him the car was going to be delivered and he made that up. I had no idea how deep the lie went. So he said, you know, the car's in Spartanburg. Um, it should be delivered this weekend. The weekend came, he had a whole other excuse. Um, I don't remember what the exact excuse was as to why the car was never delivered. I do remember we got into an argument and I was like, don't even worry about it. I'm gonna get a new car my damn self. I don't even need your help. Which is probably one of the worst things you can tell a narcissist because they love to be the hero, you know, they lo it's, it's all about them. But I was like, don't even worry about it. I'll get when I when I have the money to get a car myself, I'll do it. I don't want to hear anything else about a new car. I don't want to hear shit else about a car. Because at this point, I was spending way too much time trying to figure out are we getting a car? Are we getting a house? Like where what the fuck is going on? Always there was an excuse. So when I told him, I don't want to hear anything else about a car and I am not going to a dealership to test drive another car, um, that ended that whole discussion right there. So this is what I'm, this is where I'm going to interject what I believe was happening. I believe that my ex-husband is the type of person he gets off, uh, you know, nut. He gets off on you being excited about something that he knows you will never get. So I believe that he enjoyed going to car dealerships. He enjoyed um, watching me test drive a car and get excited about it, knowing I was not going to get it. It is the it is the level of cruelty. And again, I'm telling y'all st stuff that I found out way later on. It is the level of cruelty that I still cannot comprehend. So the whole issue about the BMW and the Audi, I think he just enjoyed seeing me get excited and then pull it away. Part 11 coming up.